Greetings from my family. They pass their love to us. Before I come to the word, I also echo the ones of our assistant treasurer in uh, thanking the members of the church, the leadership, every group, the clergy, for remaining as a family even in this difficult moment. And this gives me a lot of hope that after this we are coming out a very strong church. Though there are 21 more days that have been added to me, the are days of prayer to his glory. We need to keep on praying for the world, to keep on praying for our nation, Kenya. When we see what is happening around, we began by locusts, COVID-19 came, the floods, and the floods are causing more havoc to our nation even than COVID-19 itself. The political temperatures that are rising each and every day, this is a season to pray for our nation more than ever before. I challenge us to be spiritual midwives. And who are spiritual midwives? These are people who pray in accordance to the will of God so that the will of God is going to be achieved here on earth. Yes, there is a phrase we make when we are reciting our Lord's Prayer, that thy kingdom come. God's kingdom cannot just come. It is spiritual midwives who are going to ensure that God's kingdom is within us. I remember I've been saying that I believe that COVID-19, the season for our pain and suffering is over, and all the church needs now, they are the spiritual midwives who are going to understand the prophecy, to understand the times and the seasons. I remember some maybe a month or so ago as I was ministering, I brought to our attention a prophetic message that was given in 1986 pertaining COVID-19. And the message was that the entertainment world would shut down, the economies of the world would be paralyzed, nations would be surprised and they would be gripped by fear. Churches would close. And God had said that America would be hit the most, specifically New York. And I feel this has already happened. And what we need is Daniel chapter 9 from verse 1. Verse 2 whereby Daniel says that he understood from the scriptures that the season for the Babylonian captivity was over. And therefore Daniel in prayer, in fasting, in sackcloth, he became the spiritual midwife to give birth to the deliverance that the Lord had promised. The Israelites were to stay in Egyptian captivity for 400 years, but they stayed for 430. Why the 30 years? The 30 years was as a result of them not understanding the seasons. And the moment they cried to God, remember what God told Moses in Exodus 3? He appeared to Moses through the burning bush and he told him, I have heard the cry of my people Israel, which means the Israelites became like spiritual midwives. They prayed at the gates, the gates of confirmation of the prophetic word that God had given. So I strongly feel that now that the prophecy of 1986 has been fulfilled, we may continue suffering, not because it is godly, but because we are not attaining the status of spiritual midwives. 
So please, don't just languish at home. Don't just be annoyed. Don't just be confused. Be a spiritual midwife and pray that God brings revival to the church. Because the second part of the 1986 prophecy was that after all this has happened, there would be a third reawakening, a revival that the world has not seen. And that is what the church should be praying for. Having said that, let me go back to our sermon today. I'm ministering about spiritual food. On Wednesday, I began this series and I said that anyone who has ever been on diet can understand that the things you are told not to eat, they taste very sweet. The things you are told to eat, they don't have a taste. And the things you are prohibited from eating, you find them everywhere. But the things you are required to eat, they kind of have a way of being expensive, and they are not found just everywhere. And I ended by saying that we are going to read Psalms 19, and that is the key scripture for today. Let me continue by saying that Psalms 19 is dedicated to God's revelation of himself to humanity. We have all heard what verse 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his hard work. The first six verses of this psalm speak to us about the revelation of God in nature. When you look around, you can see God, because God is a revelation. The depth that I know God depends on the revelation I have about God. So if you know God as a healer, then it means that's a revelation. If you know God as a provider, it means it's a revelation. And therefore, the first six verses, they take us through the revelation of God in nature. And on Wednesday, I said that God is always about the business of revealing himself to man, his crowning creation, so that no one can claim before him they did not know there is a God. This is what the scripture says in Romans 1, verse 20, which says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and and Godhead so that men are without excuse. From general revelation in the first six verses, the psalmist moves to the written revelation. As we deal with the scripture intake this morning, as a spiritual discipline, we are going to begin by looking at what the Bible tells us about itself and the role it plays in the life of the believer. Praise be to God. Because our daily food, our daily bread, when the Bible says, give us this day our daily bread, the Bible is not talking about the product of wheat. The Bible is talking about a specific word for that given day. Because for every single day, God releases a word for each one of us. And our success in each day life is determined by our ability to get to understand the word that God has for me for that particular day. For my word for today is not my word for yesterday. It's not my word for tomorrow. My word for today carries a package that has God's answers to the questions I have today. Let us have a look at the description of the word of God from verse 7 to 9. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. That's according to King James Version of the Bible. This means the word of God is without blemish and it is complete. It lacks nothing. Perfection here speaks to wholeness. It has, it has a nothing I mean, it has lost nothing, and its perfection is the basis within which all 
one of the other characteristics of God is found. The word of God lacks nothing. It is perfect. Within God's word, we find everything we need to know about who God is and who we are. Some people are living in a crisis in life. They can't understand themselves, who they are. They can't understand who God is. Well, the who you are and who God is can only be found in the word of God. Why? Remember, we were formed by the word. We are a product of his word. And therefore, in his word, we get our identity. Our identity is not in the other things, but our identity is in the word of God. It tells us about the devastating effects of our sins and the perfect sacrifice of our Savior. The Word of God tells us all we need to know about eternity and about how we, we can come to be in fellowship with God. It is complete. We don't need another testimony. Well, I know science and our culture, they have a lot to say, but the Word of God is complete. We don't need any other testimony. The word restore in the Hebrew can mean to revive but it can also mean to return, as in repent. As God's word is perfect, its effect on the soul who reigns it and applies it is that it calls us back into right relationship with God. It restores or returns us to God. It is God's means by which he draws us back into right relationship with him. Our relationship with God is determined by his word. We can be in church, but not in the right relationship with God. We can be in fellowships, but, in not, but are not in the right relationship with God. Why? The right relationship in God is not cultivated by me coming to church. It is not cultivated by me observing the regulations and the orders and the protocols of, of my denomination. But the right relationship with God is cultivated by my ability to read his word and to get understanding from his word. Hallelujah. Let's continue. This is a constant necessity in our spiritual life, to be drawn back into fellowship with God when we allow our actions or attitudes to draw us away. This is one of the functions of the word of God. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The NIV says that the testimony of the Lord is trustworthy. We can rely upon it. When all around us is conflicting, where do we turn to? Like now, World Health Organization tells us, don't predict the end of COVID-19. Just like people have learned to live with HIV AIDS, please learn to live with it. Our government says after 21 days, some other people say something else. So what we are experiencing is conflicting orders. And at such a moment, we need to find the direction in the word of God. God's directions, his precepts are always right. They never mislead. They never take you down a dead end. And they are never out of date. They are always right. It is impossible to grow increasingly conformed to the image of Christ without his direction. We cannot grow into the conformity to the image of Christ without the direction from the word of God. Let's continue. God's word gives us joy and leans us into joy. The psalmist continues to say the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The word pure here is often used to describe the purity and radiance of sunlight. In fact, the NIV translates the, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. This is in keeping with Psalms 119, 105, which says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In Proverbs 6, 23 that says for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is a light 
The Apostle John, in John 1, describes Jesus as the living word of God, who is the true light, who enlightens every man in the world. God's word shields light on an otherwise dark pathway. Is the road you are walking on dark? Well, you need the light of God, for it is the light of God that is going to light an otherwise dark pathway. Like the brilliance of the morning sun cutting through the darkness at dawn, God's word casts the darkness aside and enables us to see clearly. Through it, he shows us where to step, how to walk, what to avoid, and which way to go. It enlightens, illuminates, or gives light to the eyes of our understanding. Our eyes of understanding can only be enlightened through the word of God. Let's continue. How else can we see if not for the light of his word? The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightens the eye. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is clean. The word fear here is used as a synonym of the word of God because when we read the word of God with an open mind, you see there are people who don't read the word with an open mind. There are people who read the word of God with a closed mind. Hello? Ask your neighbor, how do you read the word of God? Praise God. Now, when you read the word of God with an open mind, the word of God has a way of creating a godly fear in a person. And remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Therefore, when we read that the fear of the Lord is clean, it's like saying the word of the Lord is clean. It has a purifying effect on us and it endures forever. It does not change. First Peter chapter 1 verse 24 to 25 assures us that all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass with us and the flowers fall off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. You see, the purifying effect of God's word is that it shows us how to be in right relationship with God, and that relationship is something which endures forever. The judgment of the Lord are true. They are righteous all together. God's judgment are true. The word judgment here speaks to what God says ought to be. It is his judgment, his decision, his declaration about what should be and what should not be. And when God speaks, it is always true. You see, the challenge we have as people most of the time is that we hear a lot of voices and we fail to hear the voice of God. In counseling, when uh, we are doing counseling, premarital counseling, one of the things we emphasize is to the couple, train yourself to hear the voice of your partner above all the other voices. Yes, you can hear all the other voices, but if you can hear the voice of your partner in the midst of all of them, then you are going to go. Same case, the world around us has so many voices, voices of deceit, voices of confusion, voices of desperation, but the trouble is, are we able to hear the voice of God? Why? Because what God speaks it is always true. As God reveals himself to us in his word, he tells us the truth about things. He tells us the truth about sin, about forgiveness, about heaven, and about hell. His word is true. It never misleads, and it, it's never ambiguous. It is true. In the ancient Near East, the pagans worshipped gods which were malicious, tricky, and capricious. And even today, we have many cultures worshipping ancestral gods who are just like the pagan gons, the gons of Kirimara, the gons of Eombe, 
the gones of the ocean, the gones of the seas, all this. You see, I'm liking what I'm seeing. Like every council of elders now, they are going out there offering sacrifices to appease their gods. And even as we are Christians, we are forgetting that Christ was the last and the final sacrifice to be made. And he was given for the atonement of our sin. And after him, we need no other sacrifice. All that is needed is conformity to his divine will and purpose. Let's continue. These gods were always at odds with one another, and in their nature, they could never be sure which god was really ruling and what he or she might demand from them. They could never be sure if the story their priests were telling them was true or not. And by the way, I think God had every right, not I think, God had every right to close the churches. Do you know, engineers can meet engineers from different universities and they agree. But wait a moment, when pastors meet from different theological institutions, agreeing is very difficult. Hallelujah. Doctors can meet from all the universities and they agree on a procedure of a given operation. But wait for pastors to meet. Even pastors within MCK alone, it becomes difficult to agree, yet we are using the same, same Bible. The problem, reading the word of God with a closed mind. Because it is when we read the word of God with an open mind that we receive the instruction from the word. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that you are, there are your instructions and the instructions from the spirit of God. Amen. So when you read the Bible, you need to be very careful. You may read the Bible and you are giving meaning to the scripture instead of the scripture giving you the revelation. Amen. Are you with me? Let's go on. Now, sometimes it's amazing how even in our churches we read the word of God, even in our fellowships. You see, it's uh, in church where we can argue about a verse in the Bible. We argue to the point of almost fighting. Seldom do we say, let us go and pray to God about it for a revelation. One thing I loved about the early church is their passion for prayer and their passion for knowing what God is saying. At one moment, the founder of Methodist, John Wesley, he said, if it is not in the Bible, don't tell it to me. Hello? Are you with me? Let's go on. Contrast this to what David says about God's word. It is true. It is altogether righteous. That is, it shows, that, it shows us what righteousness looks like. In his word, God describes righteousness. It gives us a true guide as to how God would have us live. It is true and altogether righteous. In a world filled with, with such dangers, with so many competing opinions of right and wrong, God's word serves as an indispensable tool for the believer. Amen? You see, in the world, there are so many opinions. So many opinions on how to dress, how to walk, how to talk, what to eat, what to drink, and what not to. In such a world, God's word serves as an indispensable tool for the believer. In it, we have a sure and certain word from God himself. It is perfect, it is sure, it is right, and it is pure. But only, not only does this psalm give us a description of the word of God, it speaks to us about a desire for the word of God. Look at verse 10. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Notice that the psalmist talks about the desirability or value of God's word within the context of both the world and that which is sweet to the taste. David says that God's word is sweeter than honey or the drippings from the honeycomb. Why? It all has to do with the person who reigns the word and the the person who wrote it. Hello? The sweetness and the value of God's word 
is determined by two people, the person reading and the person who wrote it. Who wrote the Bible? The Bible was written through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, New Living Translation of the Bible. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. It has everything to do with the relationship of the two. Now, what is your relationship with the Spirit of God? Because the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the Bible. If you have a poor relationship with the Spirit of God, then the Word of God will not be sweet unto you. It will have no value in your life. Ask your neighbor, how much value do you attach to the Word of God? Hello? Between the Word of God and the Constitution of Kenya, or the Constitution of your land, what do you attach a higher value to? Between the Word of God and the secrets of our houses, the Meru houses, hello? You know Meru had houses. Nyumbe Kiyama, Nyumbe Ntane, Nyumbe Njuri. Pasu naenda wapi, wacha niyachi hapo. But all these are houses with their constitutions. Ask your neighbor, what do you value most? I wish I was talking to men, I would ask them. Between the Bible and the secret you were taught in that house, what do you remember most? What can you quote from your sleep? Ukiamka tu instantly, what can you quote? Is it a scripture or that teaching? Too much fire. Hallelujah. It tells you what you value. If you value the word of God, it's going to be on your fingertips. But you cannot value the word if you don't have a right relationship with the person who inspired the writing, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. Hello? The Bible is God's word, and if we are in love with God, then his word is precious to us like gold, and it is sweet to us like honey. That's how we, as God's children, should love his word. It is desirable, but it is also discerning. Verse 11 to 13 of Psalms 19. It warns us against sin which we commit unknowingly and sins which we commit knowingly and rewards us when we read it by helping us to avoid falling into sin. Verse 12 speaks of hidden faults or those which we have had times discerning. All of us because of our spiritual insensitivity suffer from time to time with this disease. We do things, we say things, and approach things with the wrong attitude. Not because we intentionally set out to do the wrong thing, but because we are spiritually insensitive. Hello? Anytime you approach things the wrong way, anytime you say things that you are not supposed to say, anytime, anytime you approach people with a wrong attitude, it means you are insensitive to the spirit. Hello? Spiritually insensitive. Ask your neighbor, how do you approach people? Even people who hurt you, how do you approach them? There is a way of approaching people who hurt us in the Bible. But the moment we approach them with our attitudes, it means only one thing. We are spiritually insensitive. Amen? How do you approach even your family? How you approach them tells us whether you are sensitive or not. As we delve into God's word and allow it to dwell richly in us, God begins through his word to show us those things in our lives which we could in other, in other way not see. These are hidden thoughts. Hello? The deeper you go into the word of God, the more revelations God will give you about things in your life. 
But secondly, in verse 13, it says that God's word reveals to us or keeps us back from presumptuous sins, sins which we willfully commit, but presume we can get away with them, or presume that because we have judged them to be insignificant, they will somehow be insignificant in God's eyes. Hello? Let me ask a question. Are there some sins that we, we think they are insignificant? The ones in my mother tongue say, to eat Yeah? Those sins that you just say to cross over. You are caught by the police and you just give a small lie, just a small one. Turn to your neighbor, tell them a small lie. See, Kuboa, Kidogo tu. The word of God highlights them. These insignificant sins that we think, since in our sight they are insignificant, God will not see them anyway. No. Dambizote nisa? Turn to your neighbor. Muambia whether small or big. It is classified as a sin. Amen? Now, let's continue. These two areas, hidden sins and sins which we commit willfully, are the two areas which set us back in our spiritual pilgrim. They keep us from being all that God wants us to be. For those who are working in organizations, every organization has got targets. Hello? And at times you meet so that the, your immediate boss checks on the targets. Don't you think it's all with the word of God? God has got standards. Turn to your neighbor, remind them God has got standards. God has got standards. And it is sin that keeps us from attaining the standards of God. These two areas of sin, they cover every area of our lives. Only by regular and intentional reading of God's word can we hope to gain the victory in these areas. Amen? If we are not intentional and we, if we don't regularly read the word of God, then we can never get victory over sin. I can pray for you. I can lay my hands on you. Probably I can even anoint you, but that will not give you victory over sin. You might be a communicant of the Holy Communion. So every moment we have the Holy Communion, you are there. But this one will never give you victory over sin. Victory over sin will come only by regular and intentional reading of God's word. Do you want to overcome sin? See, some people pray and fast so that they may overcome sin. Well and good, prayer and fasting is okay. But for you to overcome sin, you need to go a step ahead. You need to be regular and intentional in reading God's word. Sometimes people are lied to because they lack the word in them. Hello? Ask your neighbor. How regular are you and intentional in reading the word of God? Hello? I wish we could be regular and intentional as we are when it comes to WhatsApp. Hello? And the others, Twitter. And following our programs. See, there are people who have their soap operas that they love so much and they can't miss out. Once they miss out, they will need to seek for that episode. I wish we can be as regular and intentional with the word of God. One of the things we often forget is that God gave us his word, not primarily to fill our heads, but to fill our hearts. You see, I don't know whether you've ever encountered these men and women who can quote a thousand and one scriptures. Hello? And they make you feel as if you are a lesser Christian. <laughs> Hello? Have you met such people? They can give you a testimony and by the time they are through with their testimony, they've quoted ten scriptural verses. And you are left there flabbergasted wondering, how do I respond to that testimony? Hello? Well, it is good to have all 
about these scriptures, but remember, God's word primarily is not to fill your head, but your heart. Amen? Better have 10 scriptural verses that have filled your heart than have the entire Bible that has filled your head. Hello? Are you with me? Are you there? Let's continue. God's word is designed to make us holy, not smart. Hello? By the way, are you smart or are you holy in regards to the word of God? You know, there are some people who think the word of God is to make them shrewd or smart. No, the word of God is to make us holy. Jesus was not just putting scriptures. They were in his heart. Amen. When the devil challenged Jesus and Jesus overcame by the scripture, he was not just quoting, but the scripture was deep in his heart. Hebrews 4.12 promises us that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. How desperately do we need that? Some people fear the word of God. Why? The word of God reveals the sin. Ask your neighbor, are there at times you fidget when the word of God is being ministered? Hello? See, there are some people when the word of God starts being ministered, they start fidgeting. They start feeling unsafe, unsecure. Why? Because of the truth. If you've never heard that when the word of God is being preached, then you've always been entertained. Hello? You've always been motivated. Because the scripture says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces the soul and the spirit, and it judges the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. If you've never attained that level through the word of God, then you've always been in an entertainment theater and not in a church. Ask your neighbor, all your years, have you spent them in church or you spent them in an entertainment theater? In today's church, if you become so true in the word of God, at times you may find yourself in trouble. Back in 2015, I was a rural prophet for some years, and in 2015, I came now to the city to become an urban prophet. And that's when I realized there is a difference between the rural prophets and the urban prophets. Of course, not through the flock, but I got some orientations from the urban prophets. They summoned me and they told me, where to make kujua? Hiyo injili yako umetoka nayo ushagoe ya kuhubiria watu ukweli ukiwaambia dhambi zao. Hiyo ifa in Nairobi, Nairobi motivate people for 15 minutes mwenye ajui dhambi zake, achana naye, get your benefit, songa na maisha. And I was wow. I pity the church. Turn to your neighbor and ask them. Would you rather receive the word of truth or you'd rather receive a motivation for 15 minutes? Then you give the pastor his benefits and he leaves you alone. Get the church of God. See, kama hiyo ndiyo kanisa si tunakubaliana afadhali Mungu alisema ifungwe. Ili asafishe. Amen. And my prayer is that in this season God will really sweep his church. Hello. I'm very optim optimistic. COVID-19 haitatuangamiza hapana. If we get what God wants and we get it right, we are coming out stronger. Amen. John chapter 8, 32 says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let me say this. It is only the word of God and the true word of God that carries the grace to liberate a person. Amen? Being a full member of MCK will not liberate us. Being the right or the left reverend, being the most reverend, will not liberate me. My liberation comes from the word of truth. As per John 8, 32. Let me say this, you are as bound as the word of truth you have not received, and as free as the level of the word of truth you have received. 
In other words, your freedom is measured by the level of the word you receive. If you receive 100 millimeters dosage of the word, you are free 100 millimeters. <laughs> Don't you even dust them how free are you? Hello? Let's continue. It is easy to be fooled, and most often it is we who fool ourselves. God's word enables us to avoid being fooled, because when we read it, God opens the eyes of our understanding and enables us to see the truth about ourselves. The last part of verse 13 through verse 14 speaks to the devotion of God's child. Here we find the attitude we should possess as we read God's word, as we allow it to speak to our hearts, to direct us, to discern and show us our sins. Our heart's desire should be that we are kept from sin and that we are pleasing in God's sight. David's desire is to be blameless, to stand before God in purity, and the goal here is not sinless perfection, but rather to avoid doing what is displeasing to God. Psalms 103 tells us that God knows our frame. He knows that we are just but dust. He has compassion on us and pities us as a father pities his children. God knows we cannot be perfect. That's why he sent Jesus to die for us on the cross. But even though we cannot be perfect, we must still have a strong desire, a devotion that is evidenced as we seek to live lives that are pleasing and acceptable in God's eyes. This is at the heart of how David wraps this psalm. He says, I don't want sin to rule over me. I want to avoid that great transgression which will cause my life to be ruined. I want the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. How is this possible? Within the context, it has all to do with hearing and obeying. The word of the Lord as Psalms 119 verse 9 to 11 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. I want us to make a prayer together. So I want you to repeat this once after me, even as we conclude. Just say, Abba Father, I thank you for your word, which sanctifies, which guides, which instructs, and rebukes. I make a deliberate choice to seek you with all my heart. And oh God, do not let me stray from your commands. Help me to hide your word in my heart and to hear the voice of your Holy Spirit whenever I intentionally meditate on your word. The Rabba Father, I might, I might not sin against you. I choose to renew my relationship with the Holy Spirit who inspired the word so that my attitude towards the word of God shall be at par with your purpose. And now God, I want the very words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let me pray for those who are sick. By your stripes you are healed, O oh God. I release the healing power to my viewers wherever they are. And them that have relatives who are suffering, I release a word of healing. For by faith we ask and we receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you. May God keep us.